Every fabric tells a vibrant story. Every move is a symbol of pride. So get ready to learn, dance, and experience Filipino culture in Move with Malo, an online cultural workshop, a project of the Department of Foreign Affairs in partnership with the National Commission for Culture and the Arts, and in cooperation with Bayanihan, the Philippine National Dance Company. Immerse in the fusion of history and creativity. Witness the elegance of Filipino performing arts and dance with us and everyone across the world. Mark your calendars. Prepare your senses because all you have to do is move with Mano. Limang daan taon na ang nakalilipas. Noong 1521, dumaong sa kapuloang magiging Pilipinas ang tatlong bangko ni Fernando Magallanes. Lumalawak ng Espanya noon bilang kapangyarihang dagat matapos na muling mabawi ang kanilang lupain mula sa mga Muslim at mapagbuklo dito bilang isang kaharian. Ang mga nao ay kilala sa pagkakaroon ng dalawa o tatlong layag nito na hugis at sulok Nakaiba sa mga galyon na dala ng mga Espanyol sa Pilipinas sa paglipas ng mahigit tatlong dekada pa na mas matataas ang layag. Nasubukan ng katatagan ng mga nao sa tatlong taong paglalakbay ng Armada de Maluco sa maalon at mabagyong mga karagatan. Ngunit, sa pagdaong nila rito, mas matagal ng talasokrasi o kapangyarihang dagat ang mga bayan at kaharian dito sa Pilipinas. Sinalubong sila nang iba't ibang sasakyang pandagat tulad ng baroto, ang malilit na bangkang may katig na inimbento ng mga ninuno nating Ostronesyano, at ang mga balanghay na tulad ng mga isinalarawan ni Antonio Pigafetta. Gayon din ang mga karakowa na kanilang ginagamit sa pangayaw o pandirigma. Ebidensya ng sinaunang diplomasyang pandagat ng ating mga ninuno ang isang kasulatang nilika noong ikasyam na siglo, ang Laguna Copper Plate Inscription kung saan makikita ang malapit na ugnayan ng mga karyaan ng Tondo, Pila sa Laguna, Dewata o Butuan, at Medang sa Java, ngayon sa Indonesia. Butuan eh, nandiyan na kung ang pagbabatayan ay uh, yung Laguna Copper Plate. So 900 uh, uh, AD, nandun na ang Butuan. Ngayon nakikita ko na ano, ang, ang tunay na unang Pilipinas ay yung ugnayan ng Mai at Butuan. Uh, ibig sabihin Mai, eh, Butuan at uh, Laguna area, Tundo. No? So ito ay uh, isang kapangyarihang dagat, talasokrasi. Na, ganun din yung Sri Vijaya. Siyempre, meron silang mga, mga tunay na nahawakang mga lugar. Pero ang pinaka-importante sa kanila, yung uh, ugnayang pandagat, komersyal at kultural. Dahil sa mayamang kultura sa paglalayag ng ating mga ninuno, nakipagkalakalan sa atin ang mga kapitbahay sa Asia tulad ng mga Chino at maging ang mga taga-India na nagdala rin ng kanilang mga impluensya kasabay ng kanilang mga produkto. Sa panahon ng pagdating ni Magellan, ang Cebu at Mactan ang entrepo kung saan dumadaong ang mga produkto mula sa iba't ibang dako upang doon makipagkalakalan. Sa Bisaya, na replace yung uh, anito yung the term anito ng diwata bagamat da uh, ang tawag nila sa ritual ay maganito so nandoon pa rin yung ritual pero yung yung katawagan ay uh, Indian no uh, Sanskrit uh, devata ay uh, Sanskrit uh, Aside from the fact na tulad ng ginangka kong ipaliwanag, nandoon yung uh, Budismo sa Laguna na nandoon din sa Butuan. At alam natin na si uh, Tara ay isang napaka-importanteng diyosa ng Budismo sa Silangang at Jawa. At hindi lamang dyan, si Tara ay uh, isang uh, diyosa ng mga manlalakbay. 
sa pagbabalik tanaw natin sa limang daan taon ng ating kasaysayan, ating alalahanin, na imbis na magkawatak-watak ang ating diwa noon dahil tayo ay pulo-pulo, pinagbuklod ang ating mga pamayanan, kultura at kamalayan ng ating kulturang maritima na dumadaloy sa ating mga ilog at karagatan.
Magandang umaga, hapon at gabi. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our viewers from all over the world. Welcome to the second episode of Tracing Our Roots, a webinar series of, on Filipino pre-colonial ancestors brought to you by the Department of Foreign Affairs, Office of Public and Cultural Diplomacy, in partnership with the National Consentennial Commission. Every Thursday throughout September, we will feature esteemed academics in the area of Philippine history and prehistory who will lecture on the unexplored side of our pre-colonial past. In last week's episode, we discussed an overview of our pre-colonial ancestors and the life they had before colonization. And we saw how much of our ancestors' old ways and beliefs are still with us today. For today's episode, we will discover the contributions of Dr. Jose Rizal in exposing the true story of our pre-colonial ancestors. Before we begin, we would like to inform everyone that we highly encourage you to share your thoughts and ask questions of our speaker through the comments section. Our technical team will collate them to be asked during the Q&A session after the presentation. Our speaker for today's episode is a public historian whose research covers the 19th century Philippines, its art, culture, and the people who figure in the birth of our nation. He is a professor of history at Ateneo de Manila University and also a prolific and awarded writer who has published over 30 books and writes a widely read editorial page column for the Philippine Daily Inquirer. He also served as chairman of the National, National Historical Commission of the Philippines and the National Commission for Culture and the Arts. He is also a recipient of numerous national awards and honors, including the 10 Outstanding Young Men Award, the 2016 Fukuoka Academic Prize for Contributions to Asian Studies. He was also conferred the Presidential Medal of Merit and the Order of Lakandula, Rank of Bayani one of the highest civil awards conferred by the Philippines, as well as knighthoods from the Republic of France and the Kingdom of Spain. To present Dr. Jose Rizal's contribution in the history of pre-colonial history through his talk, Rotten Beef and Stinking Fish, Rizal and the Writing of Philippine Prehistory, please welcome Dr. Ambeth R. Ocampo. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the um, the talk today is basically uh, follows our theme on tracing our roots. And uh, today, this afternoon, I want to talk about Jose Rizal's contribution in the understanding of our pre-Spanish and our prehistoric past. Um, it is very important to know that uh, before we go on, that I hope you can follow me on uh, Facebook. Um, I'm also on Twitter, so so people can can follow uh, what I write and what I do. Uh, if you're interested also in this, the advertisement, um, most of my books are available online uh, from Shopee, Lazada, and uh, National Bookstore. Um, today, I want to talk about the search for the prehistoric Pinoy. No? Um, Rizal was also interested in finding the prehistoric Pinoy simply because in the past, um, the Spanish used to claim that they brought civilization and uh, and the faith to to our islands. And for most of the time, um, our history began with the, the Battle of Mactan and Ferdinand Magellan, which closed us off to centuries uh, long before um, Magellan actually arrived. And so Rizal was interested in the prehistoric Pinoy, just as we are today. But before we begin that, we have to understand what prehistoric actually means. And when we say prehistoric, most people associate it with um, dinosaurs and cavemen, which is not exactly uh, wrong, but to be uh, correct about it, uh, prehistory is basically the period before written records. And since our first written record is the Laguna Copper Plate, uh, our recorded history begins in the ninth century um, until we find uh, an earlier document. Now, 
in Rizal's time, he did not have uh, the advances in archaeology and anthropology that we have today, but he started a search for our prehistoric past by looking into what the Philippines was before the Spanish arrived. Um, when I was a student, I had um, attended a class. I attended in UP the class of the late the Arsenio Manuel, anthropologist. And maybe because he knew I was a historian, he, he only wrote once uh, in the entire semester in this course on prehistory, he only wrote once on the board and on the first day. And what he wrote there was where history ends, anthropology begins. And uh, Manuel was telling me that as a historian, I am bound by written record. And he says, everything before that is close to me. So when I was studying Rizal, I realized that while Rizal was also bound by historical document, his mind explored what it was like before the coming of Spain. Now, when he returned to the Philippines in 1887, a jar was excavated in Mandaluyong, which carried these little gold pellets, which we know numismatists call piloncitos. Uh, this is the earliest known currency that was used in the islands. You know, in the 10th to the 12th century, it is made of um, gold. Uh, it is, it's round, and on it is stamped the pre-colonial character for ma, or ma, which most people think mean either Manila or um, some people think it might mean it's short for emas, which is the Malay word for gold. But uh, Rizal was shown one or two of these piloncitos. And when he saw it, he immediately and correctly identified this, not just as a, you know, a, uh, some, some buried treasure they found, but he correctly identified them as the ancient currency of the pre-Spanish Filipinos. So when, when you think about it, you know, uh, Rizal did not have the, um, the reference books that we have today, but he was so keen on, on uh, ethnography and social sciences that he was able to correctly identify this. Um, Um, we had written literature and books that, well, as we have been told in our in, in history class, that when the Spanish came, all of these things were, were destroyed as work of the devil. But uh, I'd like to think that today that we are more sober, we should rethink that and realize that uh, actually some parts of our culture were not really obliterated, but they are actually survived because the Spanish decided to um, to study them. We have vocabularios. That's why our languages have survived. And one of the first books published in the Philippines was published in Baybayin in 1593, the Doctrina Christiana, of which only one copy remains in the entire universe. Well, long before that copy was found, 
uh, when Rizal translated uh, Schiller's William Tell in 1887 from the original German into Tagalog, he wrote and gave us his ideas on how Tagalog should be written. So some some of the things in which we in we, the, the ways in which we write Tagalog today, like we use a K instead of the C, etc., um, were all innovations that Rizal thought of uh, while he was translating William Tell. So at the end of his translation of William Tell, he gives some of the um, some of the things he thought about in the uh, writing of uh, modern uh, Tagalog, which later became modern Filipino. But in this manuscript, you can see that Rizal actually wrote out the Baybayin or the, the alphabet uh, in pre-colonial script. And for this, he actually put the citation, which is a bit blurred. It's Trinidad P. Pardo de uh, Trinidad Pardo de Tavera, one of his friends, uh, who had published a book on Sanskrit in the Tagalog language. So it was not only Rizal who was interested in excavating the pre-Spanish past. He's only one of these 19th century um, expatriate Filipinos who were interested. We had Pedro Paterno, for example, who uh, used to say that following the Bible, um, you know, the Garden of Eden was in the east, east of where he does not specify, but he claims that the Philippines is in the east and the Garden of Eden was the Philippines and that the forbidden fruit was not the red apple or the fig that is mentioned in the Bible, but rather it was a luscious yellow Philippine mango. Um, Isabelo de los Reyes, Juan Luna, Trinidad Pardo de Tavera, all of them, when they were in Europe, were all interested in finding out what was the Philippines like before the Spanish came. And this is a question that recurs even in our time as we try to find out who we are, why we are, and why we are the way that we are. How to find our national identity is also rooted in our past and in our pre-colonial past. Now, Rizal was also interested in geography and in cartography, and he has left us with what has been declared one of the national treasures. If you go to the Pitan today and you go in front of the church, you will find a little piece of uh, landscaping on the park. So it's a green thing. When you're on the ground, <clears throat> it just looks like this. Um, but when you go up to the church tower, you will see that Rizal had created a relief map of Mindanao. His original plan was long before the relief map in Luneta was created. Rizal wanted to do a whole relief map of the Philippines in, in that park in the Pitan because he was so bored in exile. But like many things that Rizal was into, he started many things and didn't finish them. So we are left with Rizal's relief map of the Pitan. Rizal was also interested in ethnography, especially in the Pitan. He would uh, study their language. He would study their um, study their customs. He even wrote a, a treatise on the cure of the bewitched because many of his patients would come and say, you know, what are you sick of? Oh, uh, no, kinulam po ako. And so he interviewed herbolarios and mangkukulams and wrote a short essay, which is the first psychological essay ever written by a Filipino to talk about how to cure people who think they were bewitched. But I was very surprised uh, some years ago when I visited uh, Germany. I had known that Rizal had sent um, artifacts from the Pitan to a museum in Dresden. And I didn't know that Rizal had actually sent some material to Berlin. And this was not, this was long before his the Pitan exile. Rizal actually sent all sorts of things to Berlin, mostly clothing. So he sent a whole 19th century Pina woman's uh, uh, costume and he sent a male costume. He sent Bagobo um, material. It's, it's amazing because in the 19th century, I would understand Rizal living having relatives in Luzon to be sending piña, barong, piña, uh, piña and husi outfit, but to send Bagobo and Mindanao um, material. How did he source this? Where did he source this? Why did he even think they were important? So he sent all of this and uh, 
when we went to Berlin, we found out that there was a unpublished letter of Rizal to a certain Dr. Bastian, where he says, you know, I'm donating these things from the Philippines. You might find them interesting. And on the right, you will see he gave a list of the things that he sent. So there is a camisa de piña for a man, a uh, velo de uh, a woman's veil, lambong, no, uh, uh, a hanky made of uh, piña for women. There's a shirt, there's a saya, calicut, things for betel nut, betel nut chewing. He sent a belt, uh, all sorts of things. But what I find interesting here is that there is in the list that he sent, it says one salapot of silver and horn, um, which is a 19th century uh, salapot. But you will see in the at the end of the uh, description of the salakot, Rizal wrote in German, es gehört mir, which means this is mine. So when they brought out the salakot, um, I, I resisted the urge to put it on because, uh, I mean, you know, for the curators, this was just a curious 19th century hat. But when I held it, this was Rizal's actual hat. So he sent his own salakot, and it now lies in a museum bodega in Berlin. So the whole idea of uh, this interest and this um, this curiosity for the Philippine past and Philippine culture is shown in many aspects of Rizal's life that we don't really know about. The stuff that he sent from Berlin, uh, from the Pitan, are also in Dresden, and when I went there, these were the things that were brought out. Uh, this beetle, net, beetle nut uh, tray, a uh, very heavy metal tray, was shown to me. And when I looked in the bottom, you will see it says, Dr. Rizal, 1895, the Pitan Mindanao. Now, uh, I knew that Rizal sent more than this. He sent fish, he sent butterflies, he sent... Um, natural science specimens. And I said, where are these? And the curator of the A.B. Meyer <clears throat> building said, uh, you are, unfortunately, sir, you are in the um, in the ethnograph ethnological section. You have to go to the natural science section of which I did not have time. But we have pictures of what he sent. These are the things he sent in uh, dried up or in bottles of alcohol. And from this, we know that three three specimens he sent, a winged lizard, a frog, and a bug, um, were unknown to, uh, to Europeans when it was sent. So when they were listed down, it carries um, <clears throat> Rizal's name in its scientific name. So Draco Rizali, Racophorus Rizali, and Apogonia Rizali. So we now go into Rizal and the pre-Spanish past. Basically, most people only remember Rizal's two books, but Rizal actually published three. We all know because we have to endure this in school, we had to read the Noli Metanghewe, the, the novel he published in Berlin in 1887. And we know about El Filibusterismo, its sequel, which was published in Ghent in Belgium in 1891. But few of us actually read his second book, the forgotten book called The Successos de las Islas Filipinas or Events of the Philippine Islands by Dr. Antonio de Morga. So in effect, Rizal did not actually write a history book. He annotated one. So what he left us are footnotes in this edition that he printed in 1890. Now, why did Rizal want to do um, an edition of the Morga? When he was in the British Library reading all the Philippine material he could find, he realized that what passes for early Philippine history was written by friars. And most of the friar accounts of the Philippines, what passed for history, was mixed with many miraculous accounts like uh, how St. Francis saved uh, the city of Manila from the, from the um, invasion of the Chinese, uh, or how we are told that the, uh, the La Naval de Manila, the, the Virgin Mary, saved us from uh, Dutch occupation and helped uh, stave off Protestantism in the Philippines. So when Rizal was reading this, he says, we cannot rely on prior accounts of the Philippines. So maybe we should find a lay person's account. And he found Antonio de Morga, who was a 
uh, bureaucrat in, in, in Manila. He was not um, religious. Therefore, Rizal felt he was very reliable. Now, the original Antonio de Morga, this is Rizal's 1890 edition, there are two uh, editions. They're very rare, uh, published in 1609. And um, the British Library in London had two copies, these two copies. So Rizal, when he was in London, went to the British Library, which was then located inside uh, what is now the British Museum. The library has since moved to a place called St. Pancras. And I was lucky as a postgraduate student in the 1990s that I had experienced Rizal's own uh, research in this library. The library is a very beautiful space. No, it's it's inside a dome, and this was what the library looked like in Rizal's time. Um, when I um, went to London on my first week, my supervisor gave me a a letter of introduction to the British Library. And he says, here, here, Ambet, is your letter of introduction. I want you to go to the British Library and do some research. And because I was stupid and proud at the same time, maybe because I was young, I said, you know, sir, I, I came here to write a dissertation on Rizal. And in my luggage, I brought the 25 volumes of Rizal's writing. So all I need is to lock myself up in my apartment and I'll just write my pieces. And my supervisor says, no, 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 you have to go to the British Library. And I said, no, what will I learn there? You know, I have all my primary source material with me. And my supervisor told me two things. He says, number one, that you should never be proud. And you should always remember that whatever it is that you write as a historian, there will always be some obscure German academic who has written it before you. That was lesson number one. And lesson number two, he says, you have to go to the British Library and see uh, what there is, uh, the wealth of uh, information that is inside the library. And when I refuse, he just says, okay, just humor me today. Here's the letter. Go to the library. Get your library card. Walk into the great reading room, sit down and feel intelligent. So I got the letter, got my card, and I entered. And this was the great reading room uh, at the time I was a student there in the 1990s. So I, you know, when I entered this beautiful blue dome, reminded me of the Araneta Coliseum, except that it was filled with books. And I had never seen so many books in my life. So I had to sit down and when I sat down, I literally felt intelligent. Um, they did not use a computer at the time. You can see the circular thing in the middle is the card catalog. So you would um, get out a huge scrapbook, look up the book, go to the middle, uh, request the book, and you would wait uh, at least an hour or two before the book arrived. So the seasoned researchers would put in a request, go out and have a beer. No, um, and so I. This was how I did it most of the time, and because it was very difficult to get in, only readers were allowed in. It was a very quiet place to read and to 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 study. Uh, the the library was open to the public for a few minutes, about ten minutes in the morning and ten minutes in the afternoon, and a crowd of cloud, you know, a crowd of tourists would come in, take pictures. And most of us would go out no, because it would become too noisy and distracting. But I realized when I was there that the tourists all went to a particular chair. All the tables had a number because this is where your books were delivered. And most of the tourists went to this chair, which was numbered G7. So when the tourists left, one day I asked the librarian, why are all the tourists going to G7? And the librarian told me, G7 is where Karl Marx sat. Ah, so that's it. Uh, so when the tourists had left and it was it was empty, so I sat there, and while I was warming Karl Marx's seat, uh, it dawned on me if they know where Karl Marx sat, they might have known where Rizal sat. So I went to the librarian again and said, uh, "You know, our national hero was here in 1888. If you know where Karl Marx sat, maybe you know where Rizal sat." So they said, "Wait, let's let's have a look," and so they dug up. 
and you know, uh, historic, historically minded as they are, they actually have Rizal's um, application to, to, to read at the library. And he had a letter of introduction from a friend who was working in the India office library. Um, and we actually know that his library card was, um, was issued in August of 1888. And when he was issued it, he was asked to sign, just as we do when we download something, you you check on the that you know the, the rules. Uh, so it says here, I have read the directions respecting the reading room of the British Library, and I declare that I am un, not under 21 years of age. And so he wrote, Dr. So Rizal, Doctor of Medicine, 37 Chalcot Crescent. Primrose Hill. And the lead ended, the, ended there. So I said, how come we don't know where Rizal sat? And they said, well, there's no record of him. And one of the librarians said, okay, uh, Mr. Ocampo, this is what we will do. Uh, tomorrow, you sit in seat number A1. Next day, you sit in A2, A3, until you reach the end. And he says, in, in about a year, you would have sat on all the seats and you would have sat on Jose Rizal's seat, but you don't know which seat it was. So anyway, while thinking of that, I said, why don't I request the books that Rizal uh, requested? So I asked for the original 1609 um, Successos de las Islas Filipinas, and they brought out the two. But which of the two did Rizal use? And I saw in Rizal's, the end of Rizal's um, 1890 edition of the Morga, he wrote that I copied the original book existing in the British Library and he gave the call number of the book, C32F31. And when I look at the book that was on my table, as you can see on the bottom, it says there F31. So this one, uh, the book on the left, is the exact same book that Rizal had used a century before me. So I went through it. I was so pleased uh, to, to, to see it, just to know that this was the same book that Rizal had copied out by hand because there was no photocopying machine. And later, when he published on the right, you see the Paris 1890 edition uh, of, of Morga, by Jose Rizal. And uh, when you see that, you know, what's interesting here, this is the British Library copy. In 2018, I was there and I found out that Rizal had actually autographed the copy, but I think it got torn. So half of the part of the page is missing, but we can still see Jose Rizal, Paris, 1889. Um, I realized then that after reading the successes that as Islas Filipinas and you read Rizal's footnotes, you will realize that Rizal did not write a Philippine history. He annotated one, but he wrote it from a Filipino point of view. The British Library also has a copy of the Noli Metangere, which is also signed by Rizal. And you see it's inscribed to the British Museum and it says the author, he didn't sign Jose Rizal. But anyway, what got me interested in the Morga? The Morga is 1890. Rizal's annotations are, are mostly obsolete by now. But why is it important to at least know why Rizal was reading the Morga and why he was interested in finding our pre-Spanish past? The one of the page in one of the pages, I found that Antonio de Morga in 1609, described the Filipinos who were eating, you know, fish, uh, pork, venison, etc. And Antonio de Morga in 1609 wrote, the Filipinos eat rotten fish, and they know that it is rotten because it stinks. Um, and in the very long footnote, Rizal was very angry. And Rizal actually said, Filipinos do not eat rotten food. That is bago. And he says, just because you don't understand our culture and our food, don't diss it. So what I saw here was when Rizal was annotating the book in 1888, he was actually talking to somebody who had lived centuries before and talking to the Spaniards 
of his age saying, this is what Filipinos are. This is where we came from. This is our culture. So you take us for, for what we are. And that's when I realized that therefore, the successos de las Islas Filipinas and red as it is today is important to us because it is the first history of the Philippines by a Filipino from a Filipino point of view. And if you think about it in the rest of Southeast Asia, uh, this is one of the first um, histories from a Southeast Asian viewpoint that was made in the 19th century. So Rizal, especially to, to read Morga, the most important chapter is chapter eight because it talks about what the Philippines was like during the contact period. And here Morga talks about what he saw. Um, he says that the Filipinos had a form of writing. They had their own uh, government and social system. Uh, they made cannons. They made boats. Uh, they traveled along the seas. So Rizal, by, by using the Morga, was able to bring people back and tell them that before the Spanish came, we already had our own civilization. Now, it is unfortunate today that Rizal's Morga is not used by historians because they claim that his annotations were not scholarly enough or not historically sound as they should be. And on the other hand, uh, ordinary people won't read it because you won't read the small footnotes that are in it, which you find too scholarly if you are just reading it for pleasure. But what do we see here? Rizal simply states in so many very angry footnotes. And, and you know, when you read the footnotes, they're not academic because he's always he's always angry. You know? So he's always answering all sorts of things. You know? Like um, there was a there was a a bishop who was very kind. And um, according to the prior accounts, when this bishop died, uh, they buried him. And then many years after, they opened the coffin and they found out that he was incorrupt. He did not, he did not uh, rot or disintegrate. And he had actually grown, grown a beard while he was while he was buried. And so Rizal put a footnote, who believes this? And he says, I know better people who who have less beard and, and better clothing, something like that. So when you read the annotations, Rizal uh, is, is angry, but Rizal is actually pushing for the recognition that we had a pre-Spanish civilization. Uh, what Rizal's thesis is, is when you read the Morga, you find out what we were before the Spanish came. And Rizal's thesis is that the Spanish occupation of the Philippines actually arrested Philippine development. Whatever it is that we were doing and uh, wherever it was that we were headed development-wise was stopped or arrested by the, Spanish, by the Spanish who decided to change our life and our lifestyles by giving us, instead of the by buying, they made us use a Roman alphabet. Uh, they taught us a new language. Instead of our old religion, they gave us a new religion, no Christianity. So Rizal says that for all the things that Spain claims is the civilizing process in this colony, the Spanish occupation actually arrested Philippine uh, development. So what we see here uh, in Rizal's um, exploration of um, the Philippine past was that Rizal used history as a weapon. Um, many people today often say that, you know, we need a hero who, who would fight a revolution or fight a war, um, fight physically and kill people. But Rizal was made of uh, different stuff. And he decided to use his mind and to use history as a weapon because he believed that in order for us to, to become who we are, to reach our full potential, we have to know who we are and how do you know that? You know that by know, going back to the past and finding out where we came from in order to understand why we are the way we are. So Rizal used history as a weapon uh, in order to enlighten his uh, countrymen to see 
and appreciate um, Philippine history and Philippine culture for what it is and not what the Spanish say it is not. So, in effect, after Rizal, now we have more history, we have more archaeological um, findings, we, we can actually summarize and realize that the Philippines is a young nation with an old history. We are young because depending on who you are talking to, the Philippines only became a nation post-war when the Americans recognized the independence of the Philippines in 1946, or the Philippines uh, only became independent in 1898, you know, uh, when Emilio, shortly after Emilio Aguinaldo declared our independence from Spain. So the Philippines historically is thus a young nation, but our history is not does not just begin from 1898 or 19. 46. It goes all the way back to 2,000 years and more. Now, therefore, Philippine history, to follow Rizal's um, ideas of it, he sees that Philippine history may be short, but its narrative arc is very long, and it is also a complex story. So we have to look today beyond Rizal, and to see that many of the things that Rizal said have found or have been validated by the latest archaeological findings. A, there was a pre-Spanish culture. B, they had a social um, structure of their own. Um, we had nobles, we had free men, we had slaves. And slaves, not like the Western sense, but slaves that could work in a home, slaves that could live outside, etc., slaves that could buy their own freedom after a time. Um, we had writing, we had metallurgy, we had art, we had dentistry, we had all sorts of things that Spain would claim that they brought to the Philippines. Now, uh, Rizal did not know this, but it is important to see that in recent years, we have found early humans in the Philippines, and now there is one called the Homo Lucinensis. For the longest time, in 1962, the oldest Filipino was said to be the Tabon Man, uh, later found to be a woman, uh, that was dated to be 18,000 years old. And then in 2007, they found the remains of um, a human that was 67,000 years old. And then later they found not the remains of a human, but they found archaeological artifacts that show that there were humans in the Philippines 700,000 years before. So the Tabon man uh, was just a skull cap. So when they started to do um, the, the dating, so the oldest they say is 47,000 years ago. And then they found a, uh, the, a, a part of a human, this small piece of bone, uh, which was dated to be 67,000 years old. This small piece of bone um, found in Cagayan that shows that there was man in the Philippines 75,000 years ago. Then they also found um, teeth, small bones of a small ancient human that is now known as Homo lustinensis. But the more important thing was that in Kalinga, they found stone tools. Um, these are stone tools that are sharp and um, used um, for, for all sorts of, of things. And we know that these are not natural formations of stones, although I would guess that if you're, if you're walking in a garden and you see this, you, you will not probably notice it. But in an archaeological setting, we realized that these were artificially sharpened and, uh, and polished. So this was made to fit into a hand. And so it, it shows us that th this was not a monkey doing uh, using the tools. This was a human. And... Uh, just a few years ago, they found the remains of a butchered rhinoceros, which they have dated to 700,000 years ago. And 
when they studied the remains of the rhinoceros, they found that on the bones, it, it was uh, cut up, it was butchered. And although there are no people there, we know that this is, suggests that there was some sort of uh, human, um, 700,000, probably even older than that. So Jose Rizal is important because he gives us a sense of who we are by looking into our past. And in this, I'd like to see that when we study history, it is unfortunate that we usually think of history just as, you know, dates and names and, and places. We used to be, we think of the pre-Spanish past as a primitive uh, life. But then Rizal gave us a way of looking at our past, which I think fits into our um, theme of tracing our roots, looking at our origins. And it is by looking at the past that you can see it. But what we see here is that the past is, can be used for two ways. The past can be used to imprison people's minds, people's thoughts, or it can be used to liberate. So the choice is basically ours. What kind of history do we want for ourselves? What image of the pre-Spanish past do we want to see? And Rizal had shown us the way to see um, the Philippines before the Spanish period. So I'd like to leave you with um, a quotation from Rizal that was not really used very much until I had dug it up. In many, it has sort, sort of become a proverb, a salawikain, and it is usually said to be results that ang hindi marunong lumingon sa pinanggalingan, di makararating sa pinaroroonan. He who does not know where he came from will not get to his destination. That is usually attributed to Rizal, but that's not true. He did not say that. In the Successos de las Islas Filipinas, Rizal says that in order to know the destiny of the nation, in order to know the future of the nation, one has to first open the book of her past showing how important history actually is. But hidden in a school play uh, that he wrote when he was in the Ateneo, there is an epigraph to his play, The Council of the Gods, where his son leaves us with a quotation which I think is important in our uh, quest to find ourselves and to find our roots. And Rizal says this. Rizal said, uh, you should enter the future with a memory of the past, meaning the past is always relevant as we face the un uncertain future. And uh, we, it's not a question of moving on, but it is actually knowing where we are and carrying that memory of the past to the present and on to our um, uncertain future. So this afternoon, um, what I just wanted to share with you very, very simply was to appreciate uh, Rizal's uh, role in our understanding of the Philippine past and our understanding of ourselves as Filipinos long before um, we e even became a nation. So Rizal should be remembered not just for the Noli Metangeren El Filibusterismo. I hope people, more people would read and appreciate his annotations to the successos de las Islas Filipinas, outdated uh, or obsolete as they are, and see it for what it meant, that he wanted us to find ourselves in the past and to enter the future with the memory of that past. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ocampo. Uh, I'm sure that uh, everything that you shared with us this afternoon uh, is quite thrilling for the many chapters of the uh, Knights of Rizal that we have around the world. And uh, we would also now start with the uh, question and answer portion of the program. Um, we have several uh, 
platforms by which these uh, questions could have been sent. So uh, let us now try to see what uh, we can uh, share. Uh, I see here one question from uh, Mr. Franco Guevara. Uh, were Northern Luzon inhabitants the ancestors of Polynesians and South Sea Islanders? Um, I, well, uh, I think that maybe our last session might have answered this, but uh, Dr. Ocampo, maybe if you would like to uh, begin or answer that. Wait, uh, what is the question again? From Mr. Franco Guevara uh, on our chat, you can see. Um, Were Northern Luzon's inhabitants the ancestors of Polynesians in South Sea Island? I mean, we uh, the, the new um, evidence uh, is that we, we seem to have come out of Taiwan. Um, people are still trying to trace, you know, the, the peopling of the Philippines. But what, what you really have to unlearn if you were taught it when you were in school, like me, was uh, we, were, we were taught the Bayer waves of migration theory that, you know, a certain group of people came in the first wave, then a second group of people came in the second wave. But uh, that has since been discredited. Um, so we think now there are, it's a out of Taiwan uh, theory. But again, um, it's uh, we came from elsewhere. No, so the, the, did Northern Luzon inhabitants could we be, could they be ancestors of Polynesians and South Sea Islanders? Maybe not. But uh, again, this is still in flux, no, and uh, people are still debating on it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Campo. The next question is from uh, Mr. Alexis Texon, and he asks, is there a compilation of results annotations of uh, the book, uh, The Successes of Morga? And does the Philippines have a copy which interested scholars or the public can uh, check uh, out? Check out. OK. Uh, that many things are online. Um, you can actually download um, the copies of the Morga. Uh, the 1609, um, where did I? 1609 copies are quite rare. We don't have one in, in Manila, but of it. No, there's an English edition by Cummins, but the actual Rizal edition, which was in Spanish, uh, has been translated already no, um, uh, into English in 1961, and they, it was published by the National Historical Commission. I don't know if it's still in print, but uh, most uh, Philippine libraries will, will actually have it. Uh, results are other writings, if you are interested. Um, the annotations are all in one book called uh, Events of the Philippine Islands. But his other writings on ethnography and geography, Rizal um, left us with 25 volumes of writing. He wrote a lot for a nation that does not read him. That is one of the sad facts of Rizal's life. Uh, we only read the Noli, the Fili, probably the Ultima Adjust, because that's what's taught to us in school. And that actually closes us, uh, you know, uh, blinds us to the fact that he left us with so much. Um, and many of these things have been printed continuously since 1961 by the National Historical Institute. So um, if you're interested in results writings or in results edition of the Morga, most... Uh, uh, standard uh, academic libraries will have copies for you to check out. I'm not sure if uh, there is a, a copy available online. The Spanish ones are available from the Instituto Cervantes website. It can be downloaded, but if you need English, um, you'll have to go to a library for it. Yes, please. Thank you again. Um, the next question uh, from Ron Aves is, how did our Spanish colonizers affect the way we view our pre-colonial ancestors? Okay, 
uh, the Spanish conquest, I mean, if you read early histories, as, as I told you, um, which were most, mostly written by friars, the, the standard refrain was that, you know, these people are, are primitive and they have to be civilized. They do not know God. They have to be taught a new relig the true religion. But, you know, when they came here, we already had our own social life. We had our own social systems. We had our own religion, our own system of writing. And that, that sort of disappeared because uh, we were we were raised to, to think that, you know, our colonizers brought civilization to our shores. And the importance of Rizal here is basically to remind us that we had something before they came. So how did it affect the way we viewed? It gave us a very negative view of um, what our pre-colonial past is. And actually Rizal and company also uh, were afflicted partly by this in the sense that they, you know, they, as lowland Christian Uh, Filipinos who spoke uh, Spanish or French. What would have happened if the Nazis won the war? So yeah. please. Again, this is one of the. It's a counterfactual, no? and uh, in my in my class, I often recommend that my students read an essay by the late national artist Nick Joaquin called "Culture and History." Um, in this, Nick Joaquin gives a list of the greatest events in Philippine history, and it will turn your mind around because when we talk about great events in Philippine history, we often think of, you know, the, the, the beginning of the Philippine Revolution, the establishment of the Malolos Republic, the Jego Silang Revolt, etc. But Nick Joaquin's list of greatest events are the introduction of the wheel, the introduction of the plow, the introduction of the Roman alphabet, the introduction of uh, of the guisado or how we how we cook, and um, Nick Nicotin, of course, chose all the things that the Spanish brought uh, in the 16th century. But what you see here is that Nick Nicotin was saying that history is more than historical or chronological events. History is the process of becoming of becoming Filipino. And so he listed what he thought were great events that formed us into what we are. Now, just to just to let you know, um, when Nick Joaquin was alive and I had read this as an undergrad, uh, when I met him, I once decided I would uh, I would debate with him. Now, this was my very nationalistic young stage. So I read up and uh, what would the Philippines be if Spain did not come? We would be proud. Our pre-colonial life would have progressed and we would have been completely different. But of course, that's all water in the bridge, under the bridge because the Spanish did come and change our lives, both for good and for bad. So when I uh, talked to Nick Joaquin and he sort of sensed that that was where I was going, he stopped me right away and he says, what would you be, Ambet, if Spain did not come to the Philippines? So, of course, I answered I would be a proud uh, Filipino that developed from my pre-colonial, pre-Spanish um, roots. And then uh, Nick Joaquin just said, no, what will you be if Spain did not come? And I said, I will be a, a pure Filipino without any Spanish baggage. And then he says, what will you be? And he says, you know what you will be, Ambet, if Spain did not come? I said, what? And then he says, if Spain did not come, you would be an Igorot. And I said, what? And then he says, you will be an Igorot. 
Do you want to wear a G-string? Do you, do you want to eat without utensils? And of course, you know, I, I was totally blown off and uh, they were saying that if I had not retreated, uh, Nick Joaquin would blow into his handkerchief and wave that at you to, to, to shoo you away. But it's that. No, now I think we 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 are more balanced. Uh, we we unlike Rizal who was who who saw you know everything bad in the Spanish occupation. Now 500 years after um, the contact, we now realize that what Spain, what America, what even Japan brought, they brought both both good things and bad. And I'd like to think that what we are today is everything that has happened to us before. We cannot remove, we don't like the Spanish period, we'll remove the Spanish past. It's not that. So it's a, a question of accepting ourselves for what we are to the recording in progress kingdoms that were exploring this part of the world were Spain and Portugal and to make sure that uh, things were the peace was kept uh, the Pope by some strange authority decided to cut the world in half like an orange and gave half of the unknown world to Spain and half of the unknown world to Portugal. Uh, what most people do not realize is that the Philippines actually fell in the Portuguese side of the, of the world. But again, um, they, the Spanish refused to give it back. No, so there, there were there were many negotiations. So they wanted to to move the demarcation line to get the Philippines in, and eventually, you know, for for some time it was not a problem when the kings, uh, the king of Portugal and Spain was one person, but it became a problem later. Um, eventually, they they. they a sort of swap, no? so the Spain was able to keep the Philippines, and in exchange, it gave Portugal Brazil, which I think was the was a big mistake because natural resource wise, Brazil was much what was was a better investment than the Philippines. Now the the Philippines actually uh, did not have the spices that the Moluccas had. So we were actually a losing investment. But why did the Spanish stay? Because Philip II uh, said that it, he did not mind if we didn't make uh, money in terms of spices or what the colony could give. But rather, his reward was that we should be Christianized. No? So um, uh, in that time of the, of, the, uh, of the world, in the early part, it was Spain and Portugal, and later the British came, the French came. What was formerly just insular Southeast Asia was divided among uh, European powers. So it was just a question of when you have something, you sort of stay there. No? And the Philippines was kept simply big, not only for religion purposes, but also because they saw it as a gateway to China. There was no need to colonize other people because during the years of the Manila Acapulco galleon trade, things from China and Japan flowed into Manila, went to Mexico and on to Spain and uh, kept people busy for a number of centuries. Sorry, it's a long answer, but uh, that's basically it. Yes, well, we have three more questions. I think that we can accommodate uh, with uh, relatively brief answers. So the first is from Jenny Portem. What are the books on our pre-colonial history written by Filipinos that you can recommend? Okay. Um, 
it's it's also unfortunate that most of the literature on our pre our pre um, our archaeological literature is written by foreigners. No, it's only lately that Filipinos are writing. Um, so there is a book on uh, the pre Philippine prehistory by. Uh, professor, the late Professor F. Landa Ocano of UP. And if you have the book called Kasaysayan, which is the history of the Filipino people, which was published in 1998, lavishly um, illustrated, uh, this has a whole volume on uh, the pre-colonial Philippines. And that was, you know, more recent research and written by Filipinos for Filipinos. The uh, penultimate question is, why was Sucesos published in Mexico and not in Manila or Madrid in 1609? Okay. Um, the, well, there, there was probably no one who was going to read it here. Um, um, while many books were published in the Philippines, most of the books that were printed, the early books printed were were books that were printed to propagate the faith. So they were dictionaries, uh, doctrinas, but the histories uh, were usually written elsewhere. So uh, Mexico was, you must remember that at the time, the Philippines was not ruled from Spain. It was ruled from, Me from, from Mexico, I mean, ruled by Spain through Mexico. So this, this book on uh, the history of the Philippines and the different governors general that ruled in the Philippines Uh, before 1609 was thus published in Mexico rather than the Philippines or Madrid. Madrid. And the last question, I'll read Morgas. I guess what age was resolved when he did. And does it mean his poem, Sa Aking Kababata, had something to do with Morgas' comment of Filipino eating rotten fish in reference to his poem mm. with the lines, Higit pa ang amoy ng samabahong isda? Okay. Uh, the, the, this question has to be answered in two ways. No? Number one, uh, what age was Rizal when he read the Morga? He read the Morga in 1888, so he was uh, 27 uh, years old. Um, and um, sa aking kababata, unfortunately, is the, you know, that whole line about uh, hindi marunong magmahal sa sariling wig ka, masahol pa sa hayop at malansang isda, is the most is the most quoted line of Rizal that isn't by Rizal. No, uh, I have written an article that has actually...